papers. The, there are still reports emerging from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, and, uh, of course, we now have a, a national day, a national holiday, to celebrate reconciliation. And as much as we can uh, contribute to that process, uh, the better. So it's my pleasure to hand over to Natalia, who is organizing this series, and, uh, yes, and Richard, too, who's going to uh, handle the question and answer. Welcome all. Good evening, dear guests and, and colleagues and residents uh, at Green College. Thank you um, for coming today, in spite of the weather. <laughs> and um, we would like to start um, our, in, our meeting and our uh, event today. Today we are going through one of the most unstable international orders since the end of the Cold War. Along with the ongoing war in Ukraine, we are witnessing another unfolding war in the Middle East between Israel and following the Hamas terrorist organization. Under this uncurrent, uh, un unpredictable international system, understanding the war in Ukraine has become more significant. Therefore, today's topic is devoted um, to understanding the reasons and possible consequences of the Russian-Ukrainian uh, Ukraine war. Ibrahim Muradov, Dr. Ibrahim Muradov, joined UBC as a postdoctoral research fellow in September 2022. Dr. Murado has been a faculty member in the Department of International Relations and Audit at Dnipro University of Technology since 2020. He received his PhD in International Relations from Middle East Technical University, Ankara, Turkey, in 2018. His research interests cover armed conflicts in former Soviet uh, republics, particularly Ukraine. Dr. Muradov published a number of articles on the war in Ukraine. One of his most recent publications is titled Russia's War Against Ukraine, A Security Dilemma or What? Besides, he authored two books in 2021, one on Eurasian studies and another on conflicts and peace studies. Dr. Muradov also teaches courses, has an introduction, uh, introduction of, uh, to Eurasian studies, introduction to peace and conflict studies, and international relations theory, among others. As a postdoctoral research fellow, he also delivers one course titled The Russia-Ukraine War, Its Causes and Impacts of World Politics to four-year students at UBC. Dr. Murado has been personally affected by Russia's unprovoked war against Ukraine and maintains his responsibilities at Dnipro University of Technology, Ukraine, remotely. Please welcome Dr. Ibrahim Murado with a talk, The Russian-Ukrainian War, Why It Happened, How It Started, and How It's Going. Dr. Murado? The floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Natalia Ivchuk. And thank you very much, um, uh, Professor Richard Menkis, for organizing this um, meaningful event and inviting us um, to um, express our opinion about the war in Ukraine. So I'm, I'm working on this subject for the last five years, and I'm, uh, my expertise is international relations. Usually we are ignoring the, the humanitarian aspect of um, the wars. Unfortunately, that's, that's the case, especially uh, the international relations expert. We focus on power politics, great powers. Uh, usually we do, uh, unfortunately, ignore uh, human dimension. So I, I, I will not do that for this time. Uh, I want to draw attention to this humanitarian aspect. So unfortunately, I myself became the victim of this war with my family. You can see a little boy um, back there. So he was one year old 
when the war started on 24th of February, 2023, um, sorry, 2022. So it was um, early in the morning, 4 ter uh, 4.30. So 4.30 a.m., we woke up because of the bombardment. Um, it's, it's really horrible, and you don't know what to do, where to go, have to go, right? And I, I, I wish um, no one would ever experience such things. So um, because of, I mean, concerning the, the safety of my, my family, we managed to leave Ukraine. But we are here. We are the lucky, um, lucky one. But unfortunately, there are lots of people who really lost their, their uh, loved ones uh, who are still fighting on the front line. There are lots of um, um, like destroyed lives. So this is something I wanted to um, draw your attention because now I'm going to talk about international politics. So the war, why did it happen? How did it start? How it's going? I will try to answer these questions. Um, respectively. So first of all, we need to answer why we have full-scale invasion in Ukraine. Why they started uh, this large-scale invasion. First of all, it was irrational. For me, it was also irrational, to be honest. And just like uh, all the other um, scholars who really um, devoted their careers on this subject. It just didn't um, sound something logical. It was 100% irrational. Why it was irrational? Because it was um, when we had war in Ukraine in 2014, because the, the war started in 2014 um, by the annexation of Crimea and the destabilization of Donbas. After that, Russia actually secured its political goals in Ukraine. Since then, there was no reason for Kremlin to initiate this full-scale invasion. That's why we, we think that it, it was irrational. Even before, before that, um, I will show in de detail that the West, that the Western world in general, they never welcomed Ukraine, unfortunately. They always considered Ukraine as Russia's backyard. That's the reason um, we consider the, the war in Ukraine irrational. And after especially the annexation of Crimea and the stabilization of Donbas, the membership in, in, in NATO or EU, it was completely off the table. Um, that's why it became really illogical to start uh, this full-scale invasion. But still, we, we have the question, why then Kremlin initiated this war? Still, we need to answer the question. I observed um, for the, the, the last uh, two years before the war that um, there is something going on. Kremlin tries to... Um, Kremlin is uneasy with the developments in, in Ukraine. What was happening in Ukraine? First of all, when, um, when Russia invaded Crimea and uh, started war in eastern Ukraine in 2014, they thought that either Ukraine will collapse or Ukraine will have to cooperate with Russian Federation, because they know that after um, destabilizing Ukraine, none of uh, the, the Western organization would welcome uh, Ukraine, even though Kyiv always tried to uh, integrate to the uh, Western world. So, um, so either Ukraine had to um, follow the, the dictates of Moscow, or it, it, it could collapse. Either way would benefit 
uh, Russia. But what happened? Um, what we observe in, in Kyiv, they adapted long-term strategy. What is this long-term strategy? They, uh, they had lack of military power to respond to Russia's uh, aggression. So they thought that, okay, we can just freeze this Donbas conflict in uh, eastern Ukraine, and then we can focus on our own uh, internal affairs. First of all, they had to uh, stabilize economy. Um, they had no army, almost. They had to strengthen their, their army. And more importantly, they had to consolidate Ukrainian identity. And I add to these three factors, the, 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 the last factor, to wait for convenient time to regain control over those occupied territories. So they said, OK, we can wait. We will work on ourselves. Um, yes, the West uh, do not welcome us. Uh, yes, we have a war in Ukraine, so, but we have long-term strategy. That was uh, started with Poroshenko, Petro Poroshenko um, administration right after um, annexation of Crimea and um, the war in Donbas. And in the long run, time began to work in favor of Kyiv. That's, that's uh, exactly what Kremlin didn't expect. They, from the beginning, they didn't consider Ukraine as a real state. They always consider Ukraine as artificial state. So if we uh, just destabilize this way, it will collapse. Or they will, they will have to cooperate with us. So the, the, this tendency um, that Kremlin observed, especially um, in, in 2019, um, Poroshenko administration also divided um, uh, the, the Orthodox Church. Uh, they, they had their own Ukrainian Orthodox Church. So after that, the Kremlin's hope was um, Vladimir Zelensky. Because Poroshenko adapted this long-term strategy, it was not working in favor of Kremlin, right? So they thought, uh, if Zelensky is elected, so we can have chance to, to deal with Zelensky because Zelensky was literally inexperienced uh, uh, pol in, in, in politics. It was, he, he was pretty um, inexperienced. And they thought we can fool Zelensky. Uh, he is Jewish origin. He is um, Russian speaker, uh, speaker. So why not? And when Zelensky was elected, they actually um, they were about to achieve their goals. And Zelensky, as an ordinary person who really didn't understand the, the, the real intention of uh, Moscow, they thought that, um, and, and, and Zelensky was also uh, promising peace in Donbas. During the election campaign in, in back in, in 2019, he was competing with the, the incumbent uh, President um, Poroshenko. So Poroshenko was warning Ukrainians that we are at war. We are at war with Russia. So we need to prepare. We need to maintain this, uh, building the, our uh, military and strengthening economy and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But Zelensky said, usually, uh, you are using the, the war to justify your your politics. You are trying to stay in power. Uh, there is no such thing. We are not at war uh, with Russia. We can, uh, I, I can sit uh, on the table with um, Putin. I can solve this problem. And obviously people want peace, right? If one person says, we are at war, elect me, we will um, try to uh, prepare for this this war, obviously people want just peace. And all the revolutions in Ukraine, when we look at, uh, they were not because they were against Russia. They were just concerned about Ukrainian domestic issues. They just wanted to, to have transparent government, to get rid of uh, corruption, to get rid of um, 
oligarchs who controlled the Ukrainian political system. So that was the, the grievance of um, Ukrainian people. That's why they elected Zelensky. And that was the time for Kremlin. And as, as, as I said, Zelensky also was in, in this line. He, um, he met with Putin in, in December 2019. And after meeting with Putin, he started understanding something, <laughs> uh, that not everything uh, is the, the, uh, like, like he, he thinks. But still, uh, Putin convinced him um, to initiate the, the relations between Kyiv and separatist regime in, in Donbas. And he agreed. This means you are literally legitimizing uh, separatist regime in your own country, right? From Kyiv's perspective, they are terrorists backed by uh, Russia. But Russia tries to portray those um, so-called uh, republic's leadership as uh, legitimate um, leaders. And in, in general, Russia tried to uh, present all these things uh, as a civil war in Ukraine. And they were pretty successful in, 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 in doing this. People in, in international community, when you, when you look at, uh, people were questioning, is this really war between Russia and uh, Ukraine, or it's just a civil war happening uh, in eastern uh, Ukraine? So they achieved uh, confusing international community. That's what I call hybrid warfare. Like, the, the hybrid warfare, this is not something I, I coined the, the term, but it's very um, useful to describe that period. Anyway, what happened then? What we observed, Zelensky in time tried, uh, started understanding the real intention of Moscow, uh, especially uh, agreeing with, with, with Putin that we can initiate the, the connections, the communication between Kyiv and um, separatist regimes in, in Donbas, people again reacted. People didn't welcome this process because you are literally legitimizing. And when you observe that period, Zelensky lost the popularity. He was losing ratings uh, very radically. So he, after observing this, this tendency, he changed the, the, the policy. He adapted Poroshenko's uh, policy. Exactly what Poroshenko promised, he, uh, he just um, went back and he, um, he started following the uh, footsteps of Poroshenko. After observing this tendency again, which they adapted or will maintain this long-term strategy, Kremlin thought that if we don't start war today, it will be much costly to start tomorrow. It will be harder to, to invade Ukraine uh, tomorrow than today. That's why they started full-scale invasion uh, rather than uh, maintaining uh, that favorable conditions, which I uh, explained in, in 2014. They already achieved their uh, political goals. So today, that was just an introduction. <laughs> Now, um, I would like to um, introduce you um, my, my research. I, I, I did this, completed this research last year at UBC. Uh, so the main focus of the, the research is on the question of why, despite the constraints of international structure and geopolitics, Kyiv maintained pursuing the pro-Western foreign policy that resulted in Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Key finding of the research is that since Ukraine's independence, its civil society has increasingly driven the Ukrainian government to democratize the, the, the country, which ultimately means forming a pro-Western foreign policy. What is all this international structure, geopolitics? As I said, even before 2014, the West considered Ukraine as Russia's sphere of influence. That's the, that's the international structure. 
or limitations of international structure on Kyiv. Just imagine, you try to integrate to the West, but the West doesn't welcome you. They consider you as Russia's sphere of influence. And how this relationship formed, it actually um, creates the, the, the structure between Moscow and uh, the Western um, countries regarding Ukraine. So the Ukrainian's destiny or fate was predetermined. That's what I call by international limitations or the, the, the constraints of international structure. But the question is, if Kyiv was well aware of this, why they still pursued uh, the, the pro-Western foreign policy? Usually we call this process if, if, if uh, there is international structural limitations on you, you just follow the, the logic of international structure. You don't go against the, the structural um, uh, dictates. If you, if you go, then you are punished by the structure. And what is this punishment? Unfortunately, that's war. So why, despite the, the, the fact that the West didn't welcome Ukraine, and um, still Kyiv maintained that um, orientation. So the key finding is that the research, uh, since Ukraine's independence, its civil society has increasingly driven the Ukrainian government to democratize the country, which ultimately means forming pro-Western um, foreign policy. So it was not up to uh, Kyiv authorities. Even when they pursued the, the logic of international structure, they were toppled. They're, we we had revolutions in Ukraine. Each time when they, because when you sit in in Kiev, you understand, right? You you are receiving the, the the signals. You are trying to integrate to the West, but there is no reaction from that side. And. But, but when they pursued the, the, pro, um, the pro-Russian policy, the, there was always revolution because society always demanded uh, Ukrainian government to democratize itself. Uh, obviously, Russia didn't um, uh, the, the, the pursuing the relations with Russia didn't lead that way. So usually, what we have. Um, but that's not the explanation you, you may uh, often uh, encounter in um, international politics. Usually people uh, blame NATO enlargement uh, like Andrew Wolf or Elias Goetz, who thinks it's just geopolitics, uh, stupid. Or uh, Samuel Cherub and Mikhail, Mikhail Trotsky, they think that Russia's war in Ukraine is defensive in nature rather than uh, offensive. So they portrayed Ukraine as a victim uh, between the, 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 the Russia and the, and the West. So again, some other uh, scholars, Michel Ruhle, who thinks that Russia invaded Ukraine because of their desperation rather than... So they, they don't think that Russia, uh, the, the Moscow is aggressive. They think that they had to react. It's either defensive or uh, because of the, the provocations from the, from the West. So Rain Mullerson says, uh, some people have been working hard for years to turn Ukraine into a bridgehead with no regard for what it might ultimately mean for both Ukraine and Russia. So usually they blame uh, Ukraine. These are some other professors among them. You may have heard about Mersheimer, very well-known um, scholars who leads this um, the, the current. So he also thinks that uh, it's all about NATO expansion. This is a Russian professor, very well-known uh, figure. Uh, he says, Russian forces along the Ukrainian border have nothing to do with Ukraine. This is just the just beginning uh, b before the, uh, the full-scale invasion. 
um, Russian troops were stationed there to increase pressure on puppeters rather than on puppets. He portrays Russia's invasion of Ukraine as constructive destruction. So they say we have problem with the West. It's all about uh, the Western provocation. And Ukraine is just, just victim. Even they, they, they use this term, uh, Ukraine colonized, culturally colonized by the West. And we are trying to save Ukrainians from the, the Western colonization. So there is this, this uh, what is this um, um, common factor, all of this explanation? They adapt this deductive reasoning. What is deductive reasoning? Basically, you concentrate on the, um, on the, the bigger uh, tension or bigger crisis to explain something uh, at um, lower level. So however, I'm, I am trying to change or reverse this logic. And I'm trying to um, bring Ukrainian agency to this understanding. So the research doesn't downplay the, the, the importance of international structure. I also agree that um, international limitations uh, we, we, we had on, on Ukraine. But, um, but I'm, I'm ending in a different way than uh, who victimized uh, Ukraine in this process. So this research claims that any research that ignores Ukraine's will, the will which is shaped by the interaction of the state-society complex, falls short of explaining the war in Ukraine. So I will try to show how um, the West, in the first place, uh, unwelcome um, Ukraine after the, the independence. So the EU and NATO has never promised or encouraged Ukraine's membership in these organizations. Ukraine has always been treated as neighboring country or partner state. Former European Commission President Romana Prodi suggested that Ukraine was a viable candidate for EU membership in the same way that New Zealand was. This, uh, the, the, he was the, the um, president during um, um, in early, early 2000s when uh, EU and NATO enlargement was taking place in former Soviet republics, when Baltic states became... Um, became the, and joined the, the organizations. So he says EU membership for Morocco, Ukraine, or Moldova. I see no reason. Again, um, Gunther Verhagen was also responsible from the, the Eastern uh, uh, enlargement of the EU. He says, anybody who thinks Ukraine should be taken into the EU should perhaps come along with the argument that Mexico should be taken into the USA. And you could observe all, uh, frequently these um, this placards during the uh, Orange Revolution, especially Euromaidan. P Ukrainians were asking, uh, where are you, uh, Europe? The NATO journey for Ukraine is much more challenging. NATO allies, particularly Germany and France, blocked Kyiv's membership action plan application out of concern that they might arouse uh, Russia's aggression in 2008. So that was the only time Ukraine, before this full-scale invasion, that was the only uh, time when Ukraine applied for NATO membership. And... NATO rejected. Why? They accepted Baltic states in 2004, but they rejected Georgia and, um, and Ukraine. And the reason was not to provoke Russia. That's, that's very clear that the West uh, uh, takes into consideration Russia's uh, interest and they, they consider Ukraine as Russia's backyard. This, um, 
ideas, this mentality is well described by a uh, Ukrainian scholar, Mikhail Ryabchuk. He says, the Russian imperial knowledge, which gained international currency as objective and scientifically verified truth, permitted the Western consciousness and contributed significantly to Ukraine's long-term invisibility on Western mental maps. So that was the, um, the circumstances before this war. So as I mentioned, there was um, international um, structural limitations on Ukraine. But you can't explain that to, 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 to people, right? How can you, yeah, if, if I'm elected like the, the president of Ukraine in, let's say, uh, after Yanukovych or after Kuchma and observing this uh, negative attitude from the West towards Ukraine, I can say, you see, actually we have to cooperate with Russia. We have no choice. If we follow um, the Western integration, we will have war. We will suffer a lot. You can't say this because people do not understand um, this abstract uh, concepts. Because actually at the end of the day, these are our fantasies. These are experts' fantasies. These are uh, the, the leaders' fantasies. These are our imaginations. And these imaginations translate into reality, unfortunately. So if, um, if that was the case, how Ukraine followed the, the Western foreign policy? When we look at uh, Ukrainian civil societies, we can't find the answer because uh, civil societies in Ukraine was quite weak. Um, usually we expect um, uh, democratic uh, um, developments in any, any country which could be promoted by uh, civil society organizations, but we, we can't, uh, we, we, we don't um, observe such such tendency. So usually, um, civil societies in Ukraine worked. If there is money, there is work. If if there is no money, no activity. So what was that? So uh, I I claim that the the reason behind Ukraine's democratization path should be sought in its reach history of social mobilization, mobilization and protesting culture. So if you don't have strong civil society organizations, but still Ukraine was experiencing all these revolutions. Even in, in 1990, during the Soviet time, Ukrainian students organized um, a protest in, in Kyiv, which was called Revolution on Granite. And they achieved something. They, uh, toppled uh, the prime minister back then. It was very unusual during even, even Soviet time. And uh, in 2002, uh, in 2001, 2002, 2004. So this protesting uh, movement also um, should be uh, explained how or why uh, it was happening. Historically, only the western part of Ukraine had a tradition of civil society and political activities. Western Ukraine's unique history under the relatively liberal Hungarian, uh, Austrian Hungarian Empire aided in the development of the Ukrainian nation, politics, and civil society by giving people a sense of identity and agency. But in, uh, in the case of uh, Eastern Ukrainians, they were denied political participation in the Tsarist Empire. The Ukrainian language was the only one prohibited by imperial authorities as part of a government strategy to subvert Ukrainian national identity. So it's not coincident that uh, the movement always started uh, in the West. Um, Usually, uh, Ukrainian prisoners um, composed majority in, in gulags. When those prisoners were freed from the gulag, they returned to politics and founded the Ukrainian People's Movement for Reconstruction, which was called RU, in 19, 
87. They established a, a movement in Lviv. And as I, as I mentioned, the, the first protest happened in, in 1990. So in, in 2000s, what happened? The protesting culture in Ukraine didn't disappear after the uh, revolution on granite, but it was carried over to 2000s. In February 2001, a tent city modeled after revolution on granite was set up in Maidan, Kiev. And the protests were called Ukraine without Kuchma. What's Kuchma? Kuchma is the, the then president of Ukraine. Then president of Ukraine, the former president of Ukraine. A new phase of the campaign called Arise Ukraine began on the anniversary of Gongadze's disappearance in September. Gongadze was a, a journalist who was uh, killed by the order of Kuchma because he was criticizing Kuchma's administration. So let's continue. Unlike previous campaigns, the protests achieved their goals in the Orange Revolution in 2004. But uh, the Orange Revolution is mostly associated with its unfulfilled promise and with the dissatisfaction of its participants. Combination of the unfulfilled co uh, commitments, the, 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 the failure of the pro, uh, Western or Orange co Coalition to work in harmony paved the way for Yanukovych to become the new president. So they made, the people made a revolution in 2004 they elected pro-Western um, pro uh, uh, president who was competing with pro-Russian uh, Yanukovych. Actually, the, the Putin was also there to support uh, Yanukovych, but they lost. They lost the election. But after 2004, there's this orange coalition, the new newly formed government. They couldn't work in harmony. They failed. That's that's okay, right? It can be. Um, so U Ukrainians elected Yanukovych in 2010 because people do not care about uh, this leader is pro-Russian or uh, pro-Western. They they want to, um, to 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 have democratic Ukraine, and it automatically means forming pro-Western uh, politics rather than pro-Russian. But Yanukovych achieved creating a blackmail state through surveillance, corruption, and selective applications of the law for the following three years. The long-running struggle of Ukrainians for social justice, human dignity, and as many researchers have emphasized for a normal life served as the catalyst for, for the Euromaidan revolution rather than agreement with the uh, EU. Despite the absence of civil society organizations that pushed the nation towards democratization, Ukrainians uh, mobilize in the streets when necessary and hold the government accountable. In other words, Ukrainian society appears to be the main agency shaping politics in Ukraine. So right after the Euromaidan, they even penetrated uh, into a newly formed government. They become the, the uh, they they start ruling their own country. First, they demanded a total break with the Soviet legacy of corrupt Ukrainian political system, uh, decentralizing the power structure, and they also uh, started volunteering to undertake the state's job on national security because. Ukrainian army was very, very weak. Just to, to have comparison, during the annexation of Crimea, Ukrainian uh, combat-ready soldiers consisted of only 2,000. Only 2,000 Ukrainian soldiers were stationed in Crimea against 20,000 Russian combat-ready soldiers. Can you imagine? That's why the, the Ukrainian army was very weak. And when the war started, um, uh, Russia grabbed the, the, the peninsula, Crimean Peninsula, without any single shot. But when the, the war started uh, in Donbas, people started volunteering and tried to help. And they, they stopped the, the, 
uh, Russian-backed separatist movement. So they also created this Lustration Committee, Anti-Corruption Bureau, which is still functioning. These are details. So th this is a kind of conclusion of this part. Since Ukraine's independence, the, the people have increasingly played a major role in shaping the political structure of Ukraine and determining its future. Um, Maidan has evolved into the beating heart of Ukrainian politics. One couldn't explain to Ukrainian society why Ukraine was unable to adhere to the democratization path in conjunction with the EU by referring to some abstract geopolitical or international structural limitations. So, um, if there is this international uh, structural limitations on Ukraine, uh, and we have vibrant uh, Ukrainian society who constantly forms the, the governments in Kyiv, which means uh, forming pro-Western uh, foreign policy. And on the other hand, we have the West, which doesn't welcome Ukraine. And as I said, if you do not follow the dictates of the international structure, you have war. And I call this the, the, the punitive principle of international structure. The international structure uh, has predetermined the circumstances in which Ukraine could continue to exercise its sovereignty by recognizing it as falling within Russia's sphere of influence. However, Ukrainian government, increasingly driven by uh, social forces, took a different path. This was a challenge to the unspoken structural understanding between the West and Russia, which led to the punishment of Ukraine in the form of uh, Russia's annexation of Crimea and destabilization of eastern Ukraine. So the structure punished Ukraine in 2014. A similar case occurred in 2008 in Georgia. Georgia also tried to um, uh, take control over Russian-backed uh, separatist territories. They also didn't uh, consider or welcomed by the, the, the Western world and uh, the structure punished. How the structure punished? Russia starts war. Russia invades those territories. And why this is the, the punishment of the structure? Because we have no reaction from the international community, right? So they, they consider you as Russia's backyard. So you should follow that logic. Along with the symbolic sanctions against the country, against the Russian Federation, the West resumes its usual business with Russia after annexation of uh, Crimea. The construction of Nord Stream 2 pipeline was agreed in 2015, which could double the capacity of Nord Stream 1 and thereby increase uh, Europe's dependence on Russian natural gas. So the West was okay. They, they maintained their usual business. The West's overall response to the crisis comes as no surprise given the structural factors that predetermined Ukraine's fate. So what happened if the, the, the structure punished Ukraine and the West didn't uh, come there um, help? As I said, they adapted. The Kyiv did not uh, surrender. Ukraine didn't collapse or they didn't uh, have to cooperate with, with Moscow. So they adapted long-term strategy, which I already explained. So they focused on stabilizing the economy, strengthening the army, consolidating Ukrainian identity, and waiting for convenient time to gain control over its occupied territories. So it's like the, the, the structure punished Ukraine, but Ukraine also uh, adapted and tried to uh, came up with solution. So Kyiv started reacting. The Kremlin welcomed the elections of Jewish origin, Russian-speaking Volodymyr Zelensky as Ukraine's new president. I will skip these parts. I already tried to explain. So uh, Zelensky tried to achieve peace in Donbas by negotiations, but it didn't work. 
and Zelensky had to step back eventually and return to Poroshenko's line. So the, the Kremlin, observing this tendency, began to react to the, to the changes it observed in Zelensky's government by amassing at least 100,000 troops along Ukraine's borders in March 2021. Russia demanded a highly controversial list of security guarantees from the West, including a ban on Ukraine's joining NATO. Moscow would trip if the West complied with the demands. If the demands were turned down, Putin might use that as a pretext to initiate the large-scale invasion of Ukraine. When the second scenario came through, Putin launched the war on 24th of February, 2022. So this is, uh, I call the, the second punishment of inter international structure. The international structure punished Ukraine second time. The first happened in 2014, uh, and uh, uh, the second one is still going on. I mean, it, it, it started um, in 24th of February, but now we observe something different that I will explain. So this is some pictures from the beginning of the war. So, in other words, Ukraine faced the punishment of the structure for the second time, but unlike the first one, this began to take place in the form of the liquidation of Ukraine as an independent state. Why this is total uh, elimination of Ukraine's um, statehood? Because they directly attacked Kyiv. And why you are attacking Kyiv? To, to, to destroy the country, right? To end its sovereignty. And why I, I, I call this second punishment? Because the same reaction we perceived from the West at the beginning of the war. As a sign of their acceptance of the invasion, the Western countries, Western leadership, offered Zelensky evacuation as soon as this, the invasion began. So if you are going to take the, the president from Ukraine, which means you accept the invasion, right? It's very clear. Again, you are... Uh, going um, in line with the, the Moscow's uh, interest. So this is uh, directly quoted from Zelensky. Um, he says that during the when the war started, he was receiving lots of calls from the, the Western leaders, and they were telling him, you must go somewhere, at least to the west of Ukraine, and then perhaps to the, another country. If you are not alive, this means there is no president, and if there is no president, then the system itself and the state of Ukraine will collapse. So there was what they offered to, to Ukraine, an exile government. That was the, the Western solution. But what was the answer from Zelensky? Well-known uh, answer. I need ammunition, not a right. So, first time the international structure punished Ukraine, Ukraine adapted long-term strategy as a reaction. And then it, uh, the time started working in favor of Ukraine in the long run. And observing this, Kremlin once again reacted, punished, uh, or in invaded Ukraine, which, we, which can be translated as um, the punishment of international structure. But again, we have reaction from Ukraine. Ukraine still didn't surrender. What happened? Zelensky uh, refused the, the evacuation. And this is the, that process I call unsettling the structure, challenging and unsettling the structure. So there is international structure dictates something on you. And if you are accepting that, if you are uh, pursuing the, the, the logic of international structure, you may have peace, just like in Belarus, but in a narrow sense. So as an indication of challenging the structure, Ukraine defeated Russian forces at the Battle of Kiev at the end of March 2022. So this challenging, the, the unsettling the structure is not for free. You need to fight for it. 
And nobody believed that Ukraine can survive, Kyiv can survive. If, if you remember, I know it's, it's super fast, right? Uh, the, the war started exactly 600 days ago, but a lot of things happened. People already forget, forgot how it started, what was the, the initial expectations from Ukraine. So Ukrainians chose to fight. That's why they actually again challenged the, the, the punishment of the structure. They started fighting with the logic of the structure itself. When they defeated Russian troops at the Battle of Kyiv and they secured um, the, the independence of or sovereignty of uh, Ukraine, Boris Johnson, after a week, he was already in Kyiv. He was the first leader who observed this development because, to be honest, the, as I said, the West considered uh, Ukraine as Russia's sphere of influence. If you are uh, one of the, the Western leader, you think, yes, this is the logic, and we are correct. And how we are correct, you can see Russia, without any single shot, they invaded Crimea. Ukrainians didn't even react. They didn't even um, fire any single shot. So we are correct. They are Russia's backyard. They, they have no agency. This is, like in reality, you also observe. These are our, again, um, theories, or I call sometimes fantasies. But they also come true. Sometimes you observe and you, you see this is happening. That's, that's the reality. But when they observe Ukraine is resisting, Ukraine is fighting for their freedom, and then everything starts to change. They challenge the international logic or structure. And they think that, yes, they have some, some kind of agency. So we don't have to consider Ukraine as Russia's backyard. So that was the time Boris Johnson, right after the, the Battle of Kyiv, he was already in, in Kyiv. And after Boris Johnson, lots of leaders followed him, including um, Trudeau in May 2022. So Boris Johnson was the, the first uh, who visited Ukraine in April 2022, and Trudeau uh, was the, the fifth or sixth one um, visited in Ukraine. So this is the I call the, the beginning of the unsettlement of the, the structure. So the, the war is still going on. It means uh, the both sides fights for some reasons. For obviously for Ukraine, it's fight for freedom. But if we look at from Russian side, I I I I think that they couldn't win the war, definitely, because they started this war to invade Ukraine, to eliminate it, this statehood. And if that's the, the major goal, then they lost, because they couldn't invade Kyiv, uh, Ukraine survived, right? So if that's the case, why Russia still fights? <laughs> Russia actually fights or maintains this, this war to restore Pre status, uh, the, 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 the pre war conditions where the West considered Ukraine Russia's, as Russia's backyard. So they are fighting for that. If they somehow achieve to freeze the conflict, they will achieve that status. Again, Ukraine will be considered as Russia's backyard. But if they withdraw, if they lose the war, they will lose Ukraine forever. And Ukraine will start dictating its own terms for, for peace agreement. They will be free to join the, the Western family. So that's the, the, the current war. What, this is the, the meaning of ongoing war. Yeah, this is all from me. Thank you.